Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm Andrew Stuck. I'm one of the co-producers of Walk, Listen, Create. We're here to try and support artists, uh, performers and writers who get involved with walking and use walking as a key point in their practice. And we've been, you know, in the ether for about two or three years, but we actually formalised this year as a social enterprise. And just last week was the first time that the three of us, that is Babak, Hurt and myself, actually met and uh, we actually managed to contrive to meet in Eindhoven. Don't ask me how it works, but it, it seemed to be that seemed to be the point that we could do it. So we did manage it. Anyway, as I say, it's a rather strange situation because I'm now going to tell you about what's happening in a couple of weeks time before we start this event. So the salons run every four weeks and in between times we have cafes. So uh, next week we have something which is called Happy Tourist, which is which is basically a sort of unique travel agency to try to encourage tourists to get lost. I'm not quite sure how it how it all works, but it's someone called Soazic Groznik. I hope I've pronounced their, their name correctly. However, that's in two weeks time and do read about it. And then in a month's time on the 14th of December, we have Jeff Nicholson in the salon and Jeff's joined us this evening. So you know, he's just waving there. So we'll look forward to chatting to Jeff then. But today we've got Alex Roddy and Alex is, well, I already forewarned him that I was going to read this out. He he makes a statement in his book that it's occasionally when he's out walking or writing, he feels like a gear in the machine of the outdoor economy. And Alex is very much a full time professional writer and journalist and editor writing about nature, the outdoors and adventure. And uh, like many of us, he's a freelancer. So he uh, struggles a little bit with freelancing and keeping himself paid and busy. But, uh, you know, that's something that we're all kind of familiar with as artists. So I'm sure he won't be, uh, there won't be too many of us who won't know about more about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk for about 20 minutes, then we're going to open it up to questions from uh, anyone and everyone. So what you'll find is there is a chat in the uh, in the top right hand corner of your screen, you should be able to find a, a chat box into which you can write questions and I'll come back and invite you to speak them and say them yourself to Alec. Obviously, if you've got a question that someone if you if you can answer a question for someone, then please do. But first of all, we're, we're just going to ask Alex to start with. I mean, Alex has actually published two books in the last 12 months, which is pretty extraordinary. But we're here to talk about his walk to Cape Roth in uh, northwest Scotland. And Alex, perhaps you ought to tell us a little bit about the Cape Roth Trail and, and how you came to choose to, to walk that distance. Sure. Well, thanks for inviting me on, Andrew. I, I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, C Cape Roth Trail, it's a long distance walk in the Scottish Highlands. And the, the official route or the generally accepted route begins in Fort William, which is a town in, in the West Highlands, and then kind of trundles through the mountainous landscape. Uh, up to the far northwest point of the mainland, which is Cape Wrath itself. And the whole idea of the trail, really, it's not a waymarked route or anything like that. It's you're kind of free to make up your own way as you go. So I believe the route was first conceived in the 80s or 90s. Not actually too sure when it first came about. It's one of those kind of nebulous ideas. And over the years, a number of generally accepted variations have been formed. And you're looking at around about 250 miles, give or take, depending on your exact route. So yeah, it is a big walk. And the route that I took in February 2019 deviated a little bit from the standard routes in that it started at Ardnamur Point, um, which is the pretty much the westernmost point of the Scottish mainland just mainly because I wanted to explore Ardnamurk and, and then yeah went north through the mountains. <laughs> okay so wh wh you know what what was your intention in the first place did you want to do the walk or did you want to write the book I mean how wh which came first? Well it was very much the walk so the book that I've written about the journey is really about the question of what happens when we remove ourselves from the internet for a relatively extended period so the whole idea behind doing this particular walk in winter is that I'd identified myself for quite a while. The fact that I struggled with the always on connectivity of modern life. Um, of course, you can escape from it on a temporary basis to an extent, but I work from home. I'm, I'm a freelance writer and editor. Most of my work happens on the internet, so it's very, very difficult to step away from it if you need to. 
uh, on a daily basis and I realized that I needed to step away from it for, for a long period of time to figure out what was actually happening because I was starting to suffer from anxiety there was a period after the death of my father there was a bit of a perfect storm you know you, you've got grief in the mix you've got uh, a lot of work pressures and I really wanted to figure out to what extent is the internet contributing towards this so I thought well the least contrived way of doing this in the UK at least <laughs> it's always going to be slightly contrived but perhaps the least contrived way is to go and walk a long distance trail in the wildest part of the Scottish Highlands in the quietest time of year and I looked at my map and I thought well Kate Rath Trail February that fits the bill. <laughs> okay I mean you know because you're a professional writer and you're also uh, writing a lot about the outdoors you know do, do you only walk when you're being paid to write something or do you you know how or, or do you or when you go for a walk to always feel that you're thinking about how it can be written and and, yeah. and sold. Yeah. That's that's a complicated question, definitely. I would say nowadays I am almost always thinking um, about how I can convert it into a book or an article. Um, it's very rare. I mean, local walks in the Lincolnshire countryside, I live in the flatlands of Lincolnshire. So local walk, walks in the Lincolnshire countryside, I, 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 I never write about them professionally, mostly because the, the publications I write for, they're, they're more concerned with more mountainous landscapes. I have occasionally thought about pitching to country walking, but it's just something I haven't got around to. But yeah, whenever I go to the hills for about the last seven or eight years, really, everything has been uh, with at least half an eye on, on, on making a pitch. So I'm always looking for angles and so on. And that can be something I don't always like. I actually really miss just walking for myself and climbing mountains for myself. <laughs> well, because I, I, I want to know what sort of spurred you on. Yeah, you know, because a you uh, you know you undertake a very solitary walk in a very remote and solitary you know place yeah. where uh, there aren't going to be many people around. But what you also write about in the book, which I think is very honest, is you actually say that failure uh, makes a good story. So you know if you are commissioned to write about an adventure, you actually might get a better story out of it if you fail to make the uh, the destination you plan for. Yeah. That's definitely true. I was mindful of this as I walked. So the, 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 the walk, particularly the first week where the weather was terrible, um, you know, there's always that temptation on these very tough routes where you, you're always tempted to, to give up and go home. You know, I, I well remember before I became an outdoor writer, there would be trips where things would get tough. And if I had the option to go home, sometimes I think, you know what, I'm not enjoy enjoying it, I'll go home. But as a writer now, as an outdoor writer, you are always thinking about what's going to make a good story. And sometimes there's almost a, an equation you're trying to balance in your head, you know, what is the benefit of continuing? What is the benefit of stopping now? Would it make a better story if, if you fail? I don't like the fact that I'm always thinking like that, but it's part of the reality of it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I was I was spurred on by the fact that um, if I was going to fail, I was conscious that I wanted to fail in an interesting enough way to make an interesting story. <laughs> No, I was going to say, do you, do you divide up the legs of the walk based on 900 words or, you know, do you, do, you, do you kind of think I'm going to, you know, walk a stretch and plan walking a stretch of this huge long trail? And, mm. and you, you, can you break out of that kind of feeling or is that a feeling that's always there? It is always there. I mean, I, I wasn't really planning it in terms of, you know, number of words per mile or anything like that. But yeah, I, I, I was always thinking in terms of what I would eventually write because I had been commissioned to to write a, a number of pieces for the Great Outdoors magazine. So I had a bunch of gear on review and I knew that I had to put this kit through its paces properly. Also uh, an article in the magazine that was partly sponsored by a brand. So there's pressure there as well. And also part of me, I mean, part of the, the motivation for, for doing the walk was that I thought, you know, maybe I can write a book about this. Um, it wasn't the main motivation, but it was it was there as a, as a side motivation. So yeah, that was one of the other factors spurring me on. And there's every chance that had I not had all of these projects that I knew I would get out of the route, I may well have, have given up when it got really, really tough. <laughs> So, so what you're very good at is writing in different styles about the same thing over and over again. Or is yes. that me being, is that me no. being malicious? <laughs> I think that's you being very fair because ultimately it's taken literally, it's a big long walk in a lot of mud, a lot of wind, a lot of rain. It's, I guess the interesting stuff is all the, the periphery, all the stuff that happens around the edges, isn't it? As, as is often the case when walking, you know, it's not necessarily the act of walking 
that's always the interesting thing it's the uh, it's it's all the stuff around it <laughs> yeah but what i thought was great and i have to admit to everyone in the room that i've actually read this book twice now and i i really enjoyed it the first time and and the second time i enjoyed it even more because i realized that alex has the ability to write about you know a, a pretty inhospitable environment but a lot of the time he's walking over very similar patches of of, of ground if that makes sense and yet he he keeps you interested and enthused and wanting to read more because he's not only got that ability to uh, describe the area in which he's walking but to describe it vividly in different ways so you know it's all all power to your pen sir so perhaps <laughs> a question about the pen itself is it is it a pen is it notes every day to keep a journal to dictate something into your voice memo or do you just recall it all from memory how does it all work what well what's the... that's a good question i think it's it's really a bit of everything i mean i do oscillate really between different methods so in this particular route I kept a small hardback notebook that I pretty much filled from cover to cover and that I will write up every evening but during the day on this particular trip I kept voice notes on my phone quite frequently I also use photographs as a form of visual record as well because of course digital photos are timestamp and I take more photos than I think I will need for the purposes of what I'm commissioned to produce so obviously I'm, I'm always looking for high quality imagery that I can use as you know double page magazine spreads and so on but I also take an awful lot of just what you might think of as throwaway snaps that just illustrate something more concisely than scribbling in a notebook or, or even recording voice notes will uh, but yeah for me it's all about recording lots of stuff when I'm walking and then writing up at the end as well and on other trips I have used different methods so on some trips I will use entirely digital note taking uh, rather than writing in a notebook I will carry a little portable Bluetooth keyboard and I will type up the evening journal in that instead but I find that it results in a different style of note taking and I find that I record uh, in much more vivid detail when I write out, write everything out by hand so nowadays I much prefer to just take an actual notebook and, and write in it <laughs> so physical writing is something preferred yeah definitely yeah and and to some extent that extends to when I'm writing the draft as well so I quite often start out writing a draft at longhand and then later on move over to the computer and then sometimes I'll write other bits of it longhand as well because diff different bits of it seem to suit longhand writing different bits of it seem to suit composing on a keyboard so I'm not kind of I guess you could say I'm not precious about the methods that I use I use whatever I think is best at the time for, for the bit of writing that I'm doing and for and when, you know for when you take something of book length ha have you written that in chunks or have you you know sat down and written the thing from A to B you know with the farthest shore I wrote it from A to B um, so my procedure would be it'd be five p.m. to 7 p.m. every night and it took me about about four or five months and I'd just sit down and I'd it, it, it was quite an easy book to write in a way I think because I was working from my journals and because partly because the narrative almost wrote itself while I was walking the process of writing almost was the uh, the process of walking almost was the writing itself if that makes sense for other books I've, I've done them higgledy piggledy in scenes and chunks and all sorts <laughs> I mean uh, do you, I mean do you find that walking actually helps the writing is that something oh, that yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're, they're inseparable for me. I mean, of course, with the uh, writing that is about walking, that they're part of the same thing. But the, just the process of walking, I think, I, think, I, th I think as a lot of writers do find, the process of walking makes the writing flow. It makes the ideas come um, just something about you know the connection between your legs and, and your brain i suppose <laughs> yeah yeah so t t oh someone's opening a, a a can and we can hear you opening it oh. <laughs> uh, you might have to share it if you, uh, if you can just keep yourself on mute that'd be great but um yeah okay so t tell us a little bit more about cape Roth, the cape roth trail i mean you it wasn't your first time of walking it that's correct. So I had previously walked um, a standard variant back in June 2015, and that was my first real summer long distance trail in, in the Scottish Highlands. And I picked it partly because it was regarded as one of the wildest trails, one of the one of the best in terms of mountain landscape. So I've, I've long loved Scotland's mountains. I've, I've got a background as a hill walker and a rock climber and ice climber. So just to experience the mountains for a multi-day period there's a lot of wild camping involved a lot of off-path navigation it really feels like an extended mountaineering tour and 
yeah, the fact that you can pick and choose your own route as well and choose different variants through, through different glens over different mountains really, really appeals to me. So, yeah, the, the experience between June 2015 and February 2019, very, very different trails, felt very, very different, even though probably 70% of the terrain, you know, was covering the same ground again. And and you also did a recce as well, a few months yes. before you set out. Yeah, so this, this is this is key to the, the, the book, really, because one of the main hazards of hiking the Cape Wrath Trail in winter, no matter how snowy it is, really, the river crossings, there are many unbridged rivers that you have to you have to wade across and in periods of high water these are very very hazardous uh, now at the time when i was planning my winter cape rath trail uh, one of the key bridges across the river karnak in noidart which is quite a, a large relatively wild expanse land uh, this bridge had been removed it had gradually become less and less safe over the years i remember crossing it in 2015 and thinking this bridge is really dodgy i hope it doesn't fall over while i'm on it um, and it was it was removed and this river is a notorious river crossing so before the bridge was put in uh, a, a number of people were drowned trying to cross it and so i thought well I'm either going to have to cross this river or I'm going to have to find another find another way around. So in the December before I did my Winter Cape Wrath Trail, I went through Noidart just to purse that section and to find an alternative route. And I did find an alternative route, but it worried me more than the river crossing did ultimately. <laughs> it was this high level Bialik um, a kind of a, a pass in the mountains. And on the other side, I was worried about avalanche risk, cornices building up. So it's its own completely different set of hazards. You know, it's like devil or deep blue sea. <laughs> well, well I'm, I have to say for an urban walker like myself, uh, whatever you get up to is just completely extraordinary. Um, and and uh, to me, I also think it's sort of kind of terrifying that period of time where you are not only on your own, but you're putting your life in danger at many times. Is that is that something you just sort of take with ease or were there moments when you really did wonder what the hell you put yourself through or put yourself into? I mean, I definitely did frequently think what, what the hell was I doing there? <laughs> but it, it, I guess because of my mountain background, it has it's like this or something I tend to take in my stride. I mean, I, I started out kind of rock and ice climbing back in my, well, late teens, really. And, you know, I've done a lot of kind of solo mountaineering in Scotland and climbing in the Alps and so on. So I'm used to a relatively high level of objective hazard in the mountains. And that's partly why I enjoy relatively serious backpacking routes where, where you don't get any hand holding or anything like that. But yeah, particularly with river crossings and with gear failures on that trip, there was a tent failure that I had quite early on when I thought well I can't you know I can't really complete this trail with a tent that's not going to keep me dry but I was I was never in in serious fear for my life really I would say not from the objective danger on the walk no okay and and and, and not from the occasional person you met on the way <laughs> <laughs> yes I mean, tell, tell us a little bit about because the the definitely seems to be I mean Scotland is famous for it and Munro bagging and the you know all the various summits that people can collect and 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 it has an extraordinary uh, mountaineering community or whatever of yeah. uh, volunteer guides and volunteer rescue people and 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 the creation of the sort of bothies would you like to try and explain a little bit about the bothies and I'm really with if if the bothies weren't there, the wild camping would have done you in, wouldn't it, or not? Oh yeah, the the, the bothy network is one of my favourite things about hiking in Scotland. So the, the 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 bothy network really is a national treasure in my opinion. It's becoming more well known in recent years. For many many years, bothies were pretty much this open secret. The idea is essentially it's a network of open shelters throughout the mountains of Scotland, and there's also a few in England and Wales as well. And most of them are maintained by the Mountain Bothies Association, which is a group that, as you say, volunteers go out and maintain these open shelters. And they're very, very simple shelters. Most of them were former crofts or stalkers huts, you know, little cottages in very out of the way places. At the time when they were inhabited, of course, these, these glens would have felt very different because the glens themselves were far more inhabited. There would have been far more people living in the landscape in small townships and villages everywhere in the places that we now think of as, as wild and, and completely unpopulated at the time. And, and these bothies essentially are the last remnants of this far-flung rural community. Although people don't permanently live in them anymore, they do have this ever-changing community of people who pass through. And 
yeah, I, I just absolutely love bothies. The fact that you can go to a, a bothy, you know you're going to get a roof over your head, there's going to be somewhere you can make a fire, and it's just this this blend of like-minded people, firelight, candlelight, bit of whiskey, you know, storytelling. Um, it, there's something very old-fashioned about about bothies, I think, about bothy nights. And also the fact, as you say, they do provide physical shelter, and if the bothy network weren't there, you would have to camp every single night apart from the occasional village stops and that would have made particularly a winter crossing significantly more challenging the fact that i could i knew that every few days i had a bothy where i could go to i could at least partially dry out my stuff it makes it makes the world a difference <laughs> okay so so what are the luxuries that you can afford to take when you're carrying i mean how much were you carrying anyway give us some sort of idea of the weight so, you were carrying well, my base weight, so the base weight is the weight of your pack minus any consumables such as food, water and fuel and so on. So the base weight is like the, 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 the constant, as it were. That was around about 15 kilograms, I think. But the total weight varied up to probably 23 or 24 kilograms. Yeah, which, which really did feel like an absolute ton at times. Luxuries, I really kept them to a minimum. You know, you 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 you're talking about as little as you can get away with, really. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we won't put you on the spot. Uh, okay, so from having done it, you know, what would you have done differently if you now now that you've 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 walked it two or three yeah. times? Well, two and a half times, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. What, so I think if I were to go back and do it in winter, first of all, my appreciation for the the level of challenge. Is very different now so when i planned my original winter crossing i you know i i assumed that it would be a snowy journey i wanted a snowy journey but if it had been substantially snowy i had a very warm and wet february unfortunately i'm not sure i would have been able to complete it despite my winter mountaineering background so i think if i were to go back and do it again in winter I would take it a lot more seriously. I would probably have more resupply caches, probably ones kind of squirreled away in the hills, um, which takes a long time to arrange, actually, if you're putting resupply caches out. And also, even though my pack felt very heavy a lot of the time, I think I would have slightly tougher waterproofs because the lightweight waterproofs that I carried really weren't up to the job with the just constant rain, particularly the first half of the walk. Yeah, I often ended up getting soaked through just because my waterproofs are old and a bit too lightweight and not properly maintained. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Maybe I should ask you a very simple one about writing as well and other writers. Uh, who, who are the writers that you most admire? Well, I've got, I've got a few, few writers that I really admire. So one of the writers who actually appears in the book, Chris Townsend, um, he's a colleague of mine. We've worked together for a few years, but many years before that, I actually grew up reading his books. So the Backpacker's Handbook was pretty much my Bible as a child. He's a very, very experienced long distance backpacker. He, um, he hiked the Pacific Crest Trail back in the early 1980s before it was even finished. Um, and he's written a lot of books about long distance walking. Um, so I find him quite inspiring. Also, Robert McFarlane, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with him. Um, the Wild Places, absolutely fundamental book for me. Also, Mountains of the Mind, just making that connection between, you know, the human psyche and, and wild places. Yeah. Uh, and more recently as well, actually, uh, Jenny O'Dell, she wrote a book called How to Do Nothing. It's not entirely a book about walking, but it kind of is a book about walking. And I've really taken her message to heart. And it's 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 part of the message that I suppose I'm I'm putting putting in the farthest shore about noticing more and, and about resisting the attention economy if, if that's what you want to do. Just doing nothing and noticing and being in nature is a way of resisting. <laughs> okay, well well that, that's terrific. Thank you very much. So okay, we're gonna open it up to uh, anyone and everyone. So I know a couple of things that come up in the chat. Quentin, do you wanna make uh, you just wrote a comment, but do you want to ask a uh, to talk a little bit about that as well. Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Quentin. So um, I was just thinking, like, because conflict and drama and adversity make a very interesting, dram dramatic kind of experience and shared experience in the war. Yeah. What kind of um, dr dramatic incidents occurred? What was your hero's journey? Ah, Did yes. Did you formed by the process of doing the war? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. So th there were a, a lot of, you know, kind of moments of adversity as, as you have in the hero's journey where, you, where you've got things that go wrong. So you've, as I mentioned earlier, the, the tent failure was a key one. 
get, finding a way around the river crossing, meeting people as well on the journey. So ironically, although I, I, I set out in search of solitude, it, it often ended up being the people that I met that made the biggest impression on me and, you know, that, 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 that really kind of made the walk. And then finally, I guess it was the... Because I walked the route in a very unseasonably mild February, evidence of climate change the whole way, I, I kind of finished the walk less concerned about my anxiety in the internet, far more concerned about that side of things. So I've become much more environmentally aware since finishing the walk. Um, I do a lot more with my local wildlife trust in the local area. And, and I, I think I just notice more now about where I am, even even if it's not something where especially interesting. <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, the interest, the thing about the subtext, you know, this kind of escape from being plugged in yeah. to the world. Did you have a mobile phone with you, or what? What was the, what was the deal with that? Did you kind of yes. have one, but it was at the bottom of the rucksack and you never <laughs> switched it on? Did you go cold turkey? It's it's a good question because as a as a as I think I mentioned, it's it's always going to be a slightly artificial experience. Any any disconnection because. There's phone signal everywhere, even even on the Cape Wrath Trail, there's phone signal, you know, at most you're going to be out of signal for a few days before you get signal again. So I did carry my phone. What I did was most of the time when I'm on long distance trails in the mountains, I put it in airplane mode anyway, because that prevents the phone from polling for signal and wasting battery life. But uh, for this particular trip, I used an app called Freedom, which actually disables your internet connection or, or whatever you want. You know, you can block various websites and yeah. I, I set that to automatically repeat every day at midnight so that I knew that I couldn't access the, the sites and things that, but, but I was still using text messaging. I was still using it as a phone to contact friends and family. And also I had a satellite communications device. So this is part of the whole cog in the outdoor economy thing, because I was being hired to write this article for the brand that made the satellite tracker. So yeah, it gets complicated. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, like there were like multiple things happening on this walk, weren't there? You like you were reviewing gear and then kind of exploring this idea of being disconnected, and and then probably having people hounding you, like, have you have you written the review yet? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, of course that all came in after I got back, you know, and then it was the the reconnection. It was it was a little bit of a culture shock, you know, checking my inbox and finding five thousand new messages or whatever. <laughs> have you written this? Have you done that? <laughs> And when you were up there at that time of year, I mean, like I was up there in August, it was mm. quite, it was quite busy, to be honest. Was it very quiet? Or were you kind of there on your own pretty much? Most of the time, yeah. As, as you say, Scotland is very busy in the summer these days. In February at the moment, it's still relatively quiet, particularly Cape Wrath Trail. There were a couple of other people hiking the whole route, and I did meet two or three other people doing bits of it. But in general, I was by myself most of the time. <laughs> so, so it's not like the Camino where you're bumping into people all the time. You can't rid yourself of these people because you're no. all walking about the same pace. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Robert, Bob, Bob Parks has his hand up, but I also got a little thing in the box for Jonathan, who's not got his video on, but Jonathan, if you're there, were you wanting to grab my attention or were you not? So, um, Bob, over to you. Okay, now you're addressing the metaphysical why, why you're walking. Instead of that, I, could you ask the metaphysical how? What I mean by that, are you walking for the fact that you're walking or for the process of walking? You referred a little bit to it. Well, what is the process of walking for you? i.e. that's not addressing the external which you're saying all the little anecdotes that happen but the yeah. internal your motivations for walking rather than the consequences i mean for example what are the thinking processes you're investigating while you're walking that's what i'm more interested in yeah sure i mean uh, yeah th this was definitely a factor for me so for me walking in the mountains particularly the big mountains once you're away from all the noise or your responsibilities particularly 48 hours maybe three days out, the mind does start to still, I find that. And it, my mind feels very different after I've been in the mountains walking for a few days because life becomes a lot more simple, of course. You, you're just putting one foot in front of the other. You're dealing with hazards. You're looking for somewhere to camp. And it's resource management as well. So I, I, the way I always look at it is that life becomes more like, uh, you're more like an animal. You're, you're less like a, a big collection of responsibilities and, 
and everything else you're more like an animal existing in the world so yeah this is a this is a key motivation for me as well when i go and, and do these big long back, backpacking trips in the mountains i i seek to to recreate that experience of just life becoming a lot more simple and everything slowing down <laughs> what are you suggesting you for example two things with that you're thinking a little bit like say and um, because we are animals oh yeah yeah the cat or whatever or a deer or something like that those sorts of awarenesses you're touching that was one i can't think of the other one i wanted to ask now but is it to do with with that because what i'm interested in is not so much as so say the anecdote but like from my point of view i'm art and yeah you know, what is what is the process of walking and what is the significance of that in relation to art history not what is it in in terms of the trees that you pass and all things so what is what is your motivation for you know what are you getting out of it what is your soul gaining what are you learning not from you know you slip up or you go in mud and all that because that's obvious yeah. what are you actually learning from the experience uh, by committing yourself to the process of walking that's what i'm more and i you suggested you hinted at that when you said you'll give yourself a particularly difficult one you yeah. know i to you know to put that at full stretch or something like that can you give me a bit of feedback on that well i really i i guess as i say it's 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 this process of simplification so it, in order to, to for me to live as a as a simpler being um it, it is is it, there's not really much more to it than that really i guess i mean there's as you said there's all the other factors around it as well there's all the there's all the the, the commissions and things that i had to do but in terms of the actual motivation for the walking yeah simplifying your life shedding all the the other stuff that you have in everyday life you know the i guess the the, the external brain that you have and just becoming a much simpler creature and putting one foot in front of the other. I, I can't say I've thought too much about it in relation to the history of art, but that, that's that's it for me. Well, thank uh, you very much. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Um, Ta Tamsin, uh, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? Tamsin, I'll ask it. I'm coming. Sorry, I'm coming. It's just responding really slowly. I'm trying to put my camera on. No, it won't won't go on. I'll just I'll just ask it. Um, you mentioned about your father dying. I'm sorry to hear about that. Is there anything that you could say about the connection between walking and grief? Yeah, that's a complicated one. So he died in 2018, the year before the big walk. And during that year, I didn't get the chance to do as many long distance walks as I normally do. So I'd done a, a few short routes, um, but I found that um, after his death, my experience of being in the mountains was quite different because he, w he he got me and my brother into mountaineering and into walking. And yeah, I I, I, sudden, I, I started recalling stories that, that he told us before when he was alive. And I guess it's a cliche to say it's a catharsis, but it kind of is. <laughs> that's, that's what I found, you know, it gives you the mental space to think things through that you don't you just don't have that mental space in everyday life you know when, I, when I'm working at my computer there's emails coming in and every, everything you just don't have the mental space to process everything that's happened so particularly a walk of this length and particularly as it happened to coincide with the first anniversary of his death as well it did give me the space to, to figure a few things out and and I guess it um, it moved a few things to a, almost a closure or not necessarily a closure but an evolution in, 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 the, in the process of grief as well so like it on on the trip i was able to to to, to laugh about the whole thing for the first time really because of course you know there'd been tears there'd been the kind of numb the shock and the, the numb acceptance but one of the people that i met on the trail young lad called sky we'd been talking about various things and we we got to laughing about you know i, I, I mentioned my father and we we got to laughing about it so yeah that was something i very much needed and yeah i felt better about the whole thing after doing the walk <laughs> okay now uh, so we've got lots of people as well as a mental catharsis then yeah yeah and i think it's just the, the simple process of walking sometimes does that you know you you need the you need the physical exercise to to make your brain work <laughs> tamsin apologies for just talking over you there sorry uh we've got a few other people wanted to ask questions simon cole has written quite a bit in the chat don't really want to have a glance at simon do you want to sort of pre-see what you've just written yeah so this this kind of falling away of things when you came back to the, the socially constructed world do you feel different about the wants and the desires you know I'm, I'm often think oh, i really want to write a book and then another voice goes well that's just your ego isn't it you want this the status and the prestige and do you when all these things were stripped away do you feel different about coming back to those things your ego drives your wants your desires this all this stress in this man-made world do you feel different about it i think i do i think i do feel quite different about it yes and i think this this stems back a bit to what i was saying earlier you know when i'm on the trail i do feel like a simpler being uh, and 
to an extent I feel like a different person. It's almost like I step into my in, in, into my physical hiking shoes and I metaphorically step into a different pair of shoes as well. And yeah, I have different drives on the trail. Um, I'm I'm primarily interested in not being cold and wet and in you know seeing the next view over the hill and you know just letting my mind blow empty. And I often just don't think about a lot of the stuff that I think about in everyday life when I'm on the trail. And you're right when you, when you get back, there are a whole bunch of other desires and drives and yeah it's it's more when when you get towards the end and you you realize that you're gonna have to re-enter the world again you you start it's almost like you start to nudge back against the self you're going to be once again if that makes sense and um yeah you start to think oh i'm gonna have to write a book about this and i'm gonna have to write these articles and oh and there was these other things that i wanted to do and and, and stuff like that and you start to realize that for me at least yeah it, it's it life's a lot more complicated on the other side but then when you're back in the real world again if, if there is you know if if, the, if it can be considered a real world compared to the walk you, you kind of forget the simplicity of the walk but you you remember that it was there and you, you you know that you want to get back to it so i think you're quite right um i think there's a whole other self that exists in the real in in in, in everyday life with its own sets of wants and maybe if we can just go for a long enough walk we can find a different set of desires and drives <laughs> well you're not tempted to switch permanently obviously no no this is the thing i i i think there's a sweet spot for me because you know i, I i'm i'm married you know i i miss my wife if i'm away for too long so <laughs> that's the main thing but uh, but also there's the, the the logical awareness that you know i can't afford to hike forever i've only got a certain amount of savings <laughs> so yeah these these desires do fight with each other <laughs> um okay so um i'm going to go in alphabetical order andrea you have a question yes uh thank you for for tonight my question is being a walker and being a writer do you think then by walking with the idea that you need to write a book at the end of it does interfere with the experience of walking yeah i think about this a lot um i don't have a definitive answer to it various times my opinions have oscillated from one side to the other i kind of accept it as something now so whenever i do a really big walk i'm always thinking about angles that i could pitch and so on but as i think i mentioned earlier i i, I do miss the fact that i used to be able to just go and do walks for the sake of it but at the same time i'm aware that uh because it's part of my job now it does also spur me on to do these things that i wouldn't necessarily otherwise do so i wouldn't necessarily otherwise pack in you know three long distance trails in a year so it kind of feeds into the enjoyment as well and i also find that the process of writing about it it improves my enjoyment of the walk after the fact so sometimes if i do if i do a walk and then i don't end up writing about it say the the, the commission gets cancelled or something like that um the notes will just sit in my notebook and I'll, I'll look for the pictures occasionally but i won't think about it that much again until you know memories will pop up or whatever whereas if i then go and write about it i have to relive the experience again and the longer the piece the more accurate that is and with a book length script you, it, it's almost like going and doing it again and you get to reappraise your perspectives on things that happened so yeah it swings and roundabouts but for me it is a net positive i think even though i sometimes wish i could have it the other way <laughs> okay uh, next up is babak hello and thanks indeed uh... Uh, I have a question about uh, something you mentioned uh, earlier. You say you use Freedom, the app, to disconnect while you're walking. Uh, I was not aware of Freedom, but it seems to be very similar to uh, what uh, Apple has introduced in iOS 15, which they call Focus, uh, ah, yes. allowing you to disconnect mm. right, from the world around you uh, when you want to. Now, but you say you use Freedom while you're walking. Do you also use it when you're not, when you're at home? Uh, or and or do you also use other tools to disconnect and how do you do this uh, when you're not walking yeah sure so um that that's a, that's a great question for many many years ever since i was a student i used a piece of software called self control which is quite a simple internet blocker that you can install on a mac and i i, I as i recall it just it just blocks everything and i found this very helpful when i was a student but i didn't <laughs> i didn't really have the self control to to use it that regularly uh, but the great thing about freedom is that you can schedule it and once it's running it's quite difficult to stop it running so on modern versions of macOS you can quit the app 
and it will quit. And I think that's due to some changes Apple's made in the operating system. But if you have it running on your iPhone, you, you can't stop a block running. It, it, I think you, you would have to actually delete the app and then reboot the phone. Um, so it's really inconvenient. So that it's for me, it's that level of inconvenience that makes it useful. The fact that an earlier version of you has said, right, at this time, I'm going to be offline. And then when, when it gets to the time, whether or not you have the self-control to do it, the app will be scheduled and it will do it. So yeah, I, I run it quite often in everyday life. For a while, I had it scheduled to block pretty much everything on the internet every single morning. I don't have it running quite as stringently now because my schedule ch has changed slightly and I find sometimes find that I need to go on various social networks to look up information about clients or writers that I'm working with. But I will, if I need to do any kind of deep work that requires concentration, I will, I will set it and I will set it running for at least two hours and it makes a massive difference to me. I, I really do recommend it actually. <laughs> so, okay, your, so your answer is really no, you use freedom also when you do not walk. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> okay, Viv, you're up next and then we'll have one, the last one from Claudia and then we'll be wrapping up with the quiz. So I know you've all been waiting for the quiz, but there is a quiz. So Viv, your question. Okay, it's sort of a comment and sort of a question. When I was in Taiwan, I went to an exhibition. I don't know his name, but a very famous apparently mountaineer who, you know, mountaineers go in um, in Taiwan. And one of the things I was really struck by in what he wrote, and in fact, I did some work myself on this, was the idea that he lost his words. If he was in the mountains for a long time, he got struck by aphasia. He couldn't even think of words. And he said, unless I learn the language of vegetable or mineral, I'm just walking along muttering and sighing. <laughs> because I have no words. And this was for him, this was a natural state of being in the mountain. And I'm just thinking, you know, as a writer, someone who deals with words as you do, you know, it's kind of the opposite of that. But I wonder if there's any pull to, to aphasia. <laughs> That's that's interesting. I can kind of identify with it. I think that the, the longer I'm in the mountains, sometimes words come to me more easily. You know, sometimes I find myself writing little haikus when I've been out in the hills. But sometimes you do see something where you just, the words just vanish. I mean, for me, the moment came, if I, I, I write it in, in the book, there's a moment where I, I kind of stumbled down into this wooded gorge. I was off path. I was a bit lost. And I came across a dipper just sitting on a log looking at me. And um, it was as if I'd been communicated something, but I had absolutely absolutely no idea what and and I had no idea to how to communicate what I what I'd lost as it were and I, I write it in the book that I, I've got this moment of, of loss where the words won't come and I have no idea so I, I can identify with that I, I I wasn't aware that it was a thing with a term but I can I can understand that <laughs> Great, yeah. Thank you. It's been really interesting. By the way, I'm from Lincolnshire as well, and I, oh, really? I think those, yeah, those flat walks are just beautiful. <laughs> oh, they are. Yes, it's beautiful in their own way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Claudia, you have the last question. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we oh, can. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I actually wanted to talk uh, something else about the Cape Wrath walk. I had a bit more time this summer or this year, I mean, and I did five long distance walks in Scotland. Mm. and among them the Cape Wrath but I only did oh, the first half and I wanted to do the other half next year but it, the Cape Wrath was by far the busiest ah, and yeah. I was I was really surprised at that because I was really gearing myself up for this complete scary loneliness I mean it has to be said uh, it wasn't in February it was in at the end of April beginning of May and um, and I'm shocked that you hear that that now or oh, I'm really surprised that you say or oh, even in February you meet people there whereas a lot of the other ones which would have been definitely not not as remote, virtually nobody ever you meet there on the walks and I don't know whether there's anything so I it made me worried that it becomes a bit like the Highland you know West the West Highland, Highland Way, way yeah. uh, which which is really disappointing if you walk the West Highland Way because it's just so many people walk it and I don't know I'm just saying this sort of I wondered whether you, whether you felt like that as well at all or not I, I do think about that I mean you're right, the, the Cape Wrath Trail has become very popular over the last few years and I'm conscious yeah. that I need to take a small portion of the blame for that because back when I hiked it the first time round I wrote a bunch of articles about it for outdoor magazines and a few other people I knew who were also outdoor writers they decided to go and walk it because they heard I'd done it and then they wrote a bunch of articles about it and it would seem that after 2015 it did become a lot busier in summer so yeah I do worry about the impact that I've had and in fact I write in the book when I went back in February 2019 there 
there were sections of the trail that had been entirely pathless on my first walk where now there were just little trace paths that had been etched into the landscape by, mm. by the people so yeah I worry about my impact but at the same time I personally think that the Cape Wrath Trail is never going to become as busy as the West Highland Way because of course the West no. Highland Way is a <laughs> way marked yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a way marked trail you know it's it's, it's a yeah, lot yeah, easier yeah. whereas I think the Cape Wrath Trail it's always going to have that there's that filter isn't there you know pe- a lot of people will possibly start out but if they don't have the skills or experience I think they'll never get beyond Noid art you know luckily there's there's easy ways you can escape so they're not going to be at a, uh, you know at risk of life and limb but um, yeah. I think it's always going to be limited in that regard hopefully yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, there is, of course, a very growing trend of in in almost anything that people want to excel themselves. Or I mean, it's not a new trend, but it's continuously growing that people want to do more difficult thing and more excelling and more remote and yeah. <laughs> and so so on. So that is certainly something that more and more people. Uh, want to and maybe it is also this internet escape that people want to do i don't know that would be an interesting one for me if more and more people want to do that internet escape it's it's possible i mean i i wonder how long it will be feasible to use the cape wrath trail as a, an escape from the internet for though because of course you know mobile phone signal is improving new masks get put up all the time and maybe in yeah. a few years there'll be satellite internet co- coverage blanketing everywhere which will be great for the people who live in the west highlands you know because the internet um you know the, the broadband is terrible in a lot of these small villages yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but it will mean that it will become ever more difficult to escape from our connected world if we want to do to do so and i do think you know everyone should have that opportunity to to disconnect if they want to okay well we'll we'll say a big thank you to alex we're now going to alex and i have put these multiple choice questions together there are five of them four answers you just have to choose one of the answers from each of the questions uh scroll them down don't put them in the don't put your answers in the chat yet we'll ask you to put the answers in the chat you know all all five question answers uh five answers in the chat at the end and uh what's the prize okay there are vertebrate publishing have very graciously given us two ebook editions of alex's uh the furthest shore so uh the farthest shore i think it is not the furthest shore and so there's the prizes so i'll put in the first question now in the chat hopefully and i'll read it to you it says scotland has no end of mountain many people get addicted to climbing as many of them as they can. Which of these are not Scottish mountain? A. Munro's, B. Sporans, C. Graham's, D. Corbett. Okay, so uh, that's your first question. Don't put your answer in the chat yet, Hattie. You might be giving away clues to other people there. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, so the second question. This is really a question about whether you were listening to Alex because he actually <laughs> told you the answer. So, um, generally accepted Cape Roth trail route starts in ends where a Allapool to Cape Wrath b Noidart to Cape Wrath c Cape Wrath to Arden and Moroccan or d Fort William to Cape Wrath I'll tell you these these questions get tougher and tougher especially if I don't if I don't uh, post them up in the chat for you so there you go generally accepted Cape Wrath to a trail okay so the next one also hinted at by Alex in the uh, in, in in our discussion I think he's been given away too many of the answers anyway frequently mistaken for wilderness the majority of the Scottish Highlands is a managed environment, but for what purpose are they not? Are they not specifically maintained? A grouse shooting, B deer stalking, C whiskey distilling, and D sheep rearing. Okay, your next one. We can all relate to what Alex calls hate zones and even a quit zone he mentions in his book. Didn't mention them in this conversation. However, you can pretty well work out what they are. But what is a Walden zone? What is a Walden zone? Is it deer free area? B a digitally free area? C a pond free area? Or is it just a bog? Okay, uh, incredibly tough questions, I know. Uh, difficult to uh, get your head round. And maybe this is the toughest one of them all, but maybe you can work out what kind of chap this Alex Roddy is. So, what is his go to luxury and why? An ultralight pillow, Kendall mint cake for a sugar boost, uh, malt loaf as it doesn't freeze, or gaiters to stop his boots filling with water. Okay, so I'm not, we haven't really got time to read them all out again. So, I'm just going to hope <laughs> that you can read them in the chat, had a chance to think about them. Now, 
Yes, you went straight in there to get your answers in. So uh, put your answers in the chat. We end up with a tie at any point. We've got to sort of finish this sentence in, you know, a few words as possible. Uh, Alex makes the decision on who wins. So Alex, can you can you spot any winners amongst them? Uh, let's have a look. Has everyone replied with their answers? Let's hope so. <laughs> Okay, shall we tell them what the answers are? Maybe that's what we should do. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the first the first question was the Sporans are the w odd ones out. Uh, thanks for Hattie for giving us a, a hint at that one. That was a big mistake, Hattie. So, but the Munros, if I'm right, they're over 3,000 feet. The Corbett's yep. are over 2,000. And the Grahams aren't worth talking about. Is that right? I think yeah. Corbett's is 2,500 off the top of my head. But yeah, uh, Grahams are lower. <laughs> yeah, okay, Corbett's so all... are 2,500. It's all done by altitude or height. Yeah. <laughs> or okay. Okay. The generally accepted Cape Rail Rath Trail route starts and ends where? Uh, Fort William to Cape Rath. Frequently mistaken for wilderness, the majority of the Scottish Highlands is managed in environment, but for what purposes is it not managed? Yeah, this is definitely a tricky question, and it's whiskey distilling. So so far, anyone who's got BDC doing well, anyone who's got BTC can look smug and feel good at the moment. Okay. Question four. We can all relate to what Alex calls a hate zone or even a quick zone but what is a walden zone alex yeah so this is a in modern terms anyway it's defined as a digitally free area there we go uh, after thorough yes okay <laughs> so smug electra okay and finally what is alex's go-to luxury and why an ultralight pillow kendall mint cake for sugar boost Mort loaf as it doesn't freeze or gaiters to stop his boots filling with water yes another Alex. fiendish question yes I, I i never take a pillow i always use a stuff sack so it's actually malt loaf it's the best hill food in the winter because it doesn't freeze <laughs> okay so what we want to know is who has got bdcbc bdcbc bdcb ah jonathan harrell has Woo. yeah jonathan, jonathan has jonathan harrell is a winner yeah i don't think anyone else has oh Oh my gosh! Only oh, 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 hold on. Nick, we... Nick, Nick May, Nick May. He didn't write the letters, but yeah, he got them as well. Sporans. Oh, so me. Nick May got them right as well. Okay, so yeah. we'll give it to Jonathan and Nick. Congratulations to you both. Well done. Uh, Sorry, you. that's me actually. Nick May is me. <laughs> oh, it's Claudia. Claudia. Well, I don't know. That's really not on. Okay, Claudia. And I just Jonathan. didn't put the letters down. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> Brilliant. OK. Well, look, thanks, everybody. A very big thank you to Alex. Uh, please go out and buy his book um, and uh, please read uh, The Great Outdoors, which he contributes too often. And Alex, do you want to just mention Sidetrack magazine? Yeah, sure. So I'm the editor of Sidetrack. It's a, it's a quarterly adventure journal. A guy called John Summerton runs it. It's his very much his uh, his brainchild, but um, I edit it. So it's it's all about kind of really big adventures, uh, mountaineering, uh, polar expeditions, stuff like that. Really, really beautiful magazine. But you won't find it in news agents. It's it's you know subscriptions and a few bookshops. <laughs> Definitely okay, worth so, a read. So uh, Alex r writes a couple of books in a year. Edits a, a quarterly journal contributes articles to the great outdoors i'm surprised he's actually got any time to do a walk it can be challenging <laughs> <laughs> anyway thanks to everyone see you we hope to see you in a fortnight's time and definitely uh, to meet up with jeff nicholson and that's on the 14th of december so thanks everyone and have a good evening thank you thank you, you all too. thank you